and you can imagine, and they live these songs. It's not, you know, entertainment with them. This is, this is who they are. And I listen to their praise and worship music all of the time. I got those MP3s or whatever she was talking about in my car and plug them in. And I mean, there's hundreds of hours. What are you laughing at, Matt? Are they not MP3s? It's USB. USB. MNO. I can sound technical. H I J. Praise God. Doesn't mean anything to me. But anyway, it's really good music. It's awesome. So I encourage you to get that. I listen to this stuff. Sometimes I'll go out and work, and I've listened to their song about my favorite thing to do. I've listened to it a hundred times in one day, just worshiping. The Lord, and I tell you what, it it does something. You know, the Scripture says that you sing unto yourselves in psalms and hymns and in spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And if you turn the volume up loud enough, you can't tell it's not you singing. <laughs> and so, even if you don't have a great voice, man, you can just really get in and put on some headphones, and everybody else may not enjoy it, but you'll be having a great time. I was on the treadmill a few months back singing something and Jamie asked me what was wrong. <laughs> Apparently it didn't sound as good as I thought I did. <laughs> Let's turn back over to John chapter 14. Is there anybody here that was not here last night? Could I see your hand if, you, if this is your first service, you weren't here last night? A few of you. I encourage you to get last night's message. I've got a brand new Teaching. Now, this is something that I've ministered on for 20 or 30 years. God showed me these things. But about, uh, well, it was during this virus thing. I was at home studying the Word, and this just jumped out at me, and I got so blessed that I sat down and wrote a 30-page little thing about this, and I'm calling it, Are You Satisfied with Jesus? And it's in publication right now. We don't have it available, but it's going to be a trifold. And it's just 30 pages. It'll be a great thing to witness to people. Uh, you know, are you satisfied with Jesus? It's kind of a catchy title. So anyway, that's in the process. You can't get it now, so don't ask for it. You know, in my meetings, we'll always have somebody come up and say, I can't be there tomorrow night. Could I go ahead and get the teaching? And I used to try and explain it to them, but people that ask questions like that aren't capable of understanding. <laughs> I've just gone to telling them, no, you can't get it tonight. You'll have to wait until tomorrow. <clears throat> but if you missed last night, you can go to our website and you can watch this and it'd be a blessing. Real quickly, let me just say that this was Jesus talking to his disciples the night before his crucifixion. And he was telling them, he says, where I'm going, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? So he said unto him in verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. So he just said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And uh, then he said this in verse 7, If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Very clear statement. And yet this time Philip turns around and says, Lord, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. It'll satisfy us. And here's the whole thrust of what I was trying to say last night is that without Philip even realizing it, he said, Jesus, we aren't satisfied with you. But if we could see the Father on the throne in heaven, we'd be satisfied. You know, most of us wouldn't ever express it this way, but the truth is, every time you express discouragement, loneliness, fear, worry, care, financial problems, any of these things, what you're saying is you aren't satisfied with Jesus. Now, I know you probably wouldn't say it that way, but that really is the truth because He'll never leave us nor forsake us, He's already blessed us with all spiritual blessings. He says He's done all of these things, and yet the vast majority of us go through periods of time 
in our life where we are basically saying, but Jesus, what you've done isn't enough. I need you to supply finances. I need you to heal my body. I need you to deliver me from depression and discouragement. I need you to do these things. The truth is, there is no inadequacy in Jesus whatsoever. He was everything they could ever need. There was no problem. They didn't perceive who he was. And this is what I was focused on last night. The reason they didn't really perceive who Jesus was, was because they were carnal. And they only knew him in the physical realm. They saw his physical body. And Jesus had done things that nobody else had ever done. He had spoken like no person had ever spoken. He had done miracles that nobody else had ever done. I'm sure that there was many things that were special, but Jesus had a physical body. It says in Luke chapter 2, verse 52, that he grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Jesus did not come out of the womb full grown, speaking Hebrew, operating in all of the things that he was doing. He started out as a little baby. Can you imagine when those kings came to see him and they put these gifts at his feet and here he was, a helpless little baby that couldn't even feed himself, couldn't control his bowels, couldn't walk, couldn't talk. And they were looking at him and thinking, this is God Almighty, the one who created the heavens and the earth. I'm telling you what, that would have taken a huge amount of faith to believe that this is God. This little baby that can't even defend itself and take care of itself, this is God. We sometimes think, wouldn't it have been wonderful to be one of Jesus' disciples? Man, I am so glad I wasn't one of Jesus' disciples because today we can see through the resurrection and through the Word, we can get a revelation of Jesus that His disciples didn't have. Some of you have heard me talk about this, but I remember when the Passion of the Christ came out and I went and saw that and I had a friend of mine in Florida who was a pastor of a church and when he saw that movie, he, he said it just... Uh, he broke down and cried and he didn't realize what Jesus had suffered. And he says it was a life-changing experience and he was really telling me about this. And so when I went to see that movie, I was expecting to have an epiphany. I was expecting to have a something where God just impressed on me uh, what he had done. And I'm not critical of the movie at all. I think Mel Gibson did an excellent job, but he could you can only portray the physical things. You couldn't really show what was going on on the inside. And when Jesus sweat, you know, in the uh, Garden of Gethsemane and he prayed and sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. I've heard uh, doctors say that that's a uh, byproduct of your heart literally exploding. He was in such agony that he prayed and his heart broke. And through the Word of God, I have had the Holy Spirit reveal these things to me. And when I was watching that movie, I was actually disappointed. And I thought, it was much worse than this. It was a thousand times worse than this. The movie, in a sense, didn't even do justice. And some of you may be thinking, oh, it was brutal. If you turn over to Isaiah chapter 52, verses 13 and 14, there it says that his visage that's the old English word for face, was marred more than any man that has ever walked this planet. I have literally seen people with cancers eating their eyes out. And I've seen grotesque things. Jesus looked worse than that. And the last part of that verse says his form more than the sons of man. I think it's the NIV says so that he didn't even look human. Did you know in that movie, The Passion of the Christ, he was brutalized, he was bleeding, he was, uh, it was terrible what was done, but he still looked human. According to Scripture, he didn't even look human. You couldn't recognize that this was a person. And I don't know exactly how that happened, but I think it probably happened when he took our sin and our sickness into his body. I've seen pictures of people that have like elephantitis and deformities and different things. And, and they honestly don't even, like their legs and arms don't even look natural. They're just huge and deformed. 
Every sickness, every disease that has ever come on the human race entered into his body and he didn't even look human hanging on the cross. And anyway, the reason I'm saying all of this is to say that as I was looking at that movie, it was so minimal the damage that they showed compared to what actually happened and it couldn't display the spiritual things. And I remember looking at that and thinking, God, I'm disappointed. And I said, what's wrong with me? And the Lord spoke to me and he says, you've got it by revelation. And he says, you know what happened to me on the cross more than my disciples knew when they were standing there looking at them because they didn't understand what was happening. They didn't understand. At that time, they didn't have the full revelation of who he was. They didn't understand that he could have come down at any time. They didn't understand that he was going to conquer death and that he would be resurrected. They had forgotten these things. And the Lord spoke to me and he says, you know me by the Spirit better than my disciples who actually walked with me for three and a half years. And that's not a pride thing. That's what's available to us. This is available to every one of us. Man, I could, I'm trying to move on to some other things, but this is really important what I'm saying. And if you turn over to uh, 2 Peter, I think it's 2nd or 1st Peter chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. Let me just look this up so I don't misquote it. Must be 2 Peter chapter 1. Uh, Peter is talking about that he's writing these things down so that people won't forget after he's gone. He said, he said twice in this chapter right here that the Lord had shown him that he would be dying soon and he was leaving behind a record so that after he was gone, people would be able to remember the things that he told about Jesus. And then he says, we haven't been following cunningly devised fables we didn't make up these stories. He says, we were there. We were eyewitnesses. We were with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration when he literally began to radiate light and his garment became shining and the glory cloud overshadowed him and an audible voice came out of heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And then Moses and Elijah showed up and talked to him and told him about his crucifixion and the things that would happen. He says, we were there. We saw this. And the reason that he was saying these things to was to impress on the people that these aren't stories that we made up. We were firsthand witnesses. This is not secondhand information. We saw it. We know it's true. But then he says this in 2 Peter chapter 1, after saying all of those other things, he says in verse 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. What could be better then physically seeing Jesus transfigured and radiate light and hearing the audible voice of God. What can be better than that? He says, we've got something that is more sure than these physical things. And in verse 20, he tells you what it is. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. And then verse 21, for uh, the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy man of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And W.E. Vines, he goes into the Greek right here and he says literally they were moved along by the power of God. God breathed over in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. That means that it is God breathed. This word is more sure, more real, more steadfast than if you had been at the crucifixion. If you had been on the Mount of Transfiguration. And you can actually know God better through the Word of God than if He was to be physically here in His physical body. Jesus even said these things in the 16th chapter of the book of John. He told him, he says, because I've said these things, far, sorrow has filled your heart. But I'm telling you the truth. It is necessary. It is advantageous for you that I depart because if I don't depart, I can't send the Holy Spirit. 
Having the Holy Spirit with you to reveal these things to you by the Spirit is better than you knowing them by the flesh. And there's a lot of people that don't agree with that. You might, in a church service, shake your head. But I guarantee if you had two doors up here and one of them said experience, feeling, emotion, and the other one said the word, most people would choose that door with feeling and experience every time. Man, I want to feel something. But did you know that there's something better than feeling? There's something more authoritative than feelings and emotions. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, our world is so out of whack in this area. You know, we were visiting with Paul Milligan and Patsy down here uh, right before we came out, and Paul was talking about when he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I mean, prior to that time, he said it was just difficult. It took him a year hearing about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and he just couldn't understand it. He couldn't get it. And then he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and all of a sudden, man, his understanding just exploded. This is exactly what Jesus was saying in John 14, 15, and 16, that he will teach you all things and lead you into all truth and bring all things to your remembrance. He will show you things to come. That, man, the, power, the Holy Spirit is the one who inspired. It was God breathed this word and the Holy Spirit inspired it and this isn't written to your head. It's written to your heart. And if you will open up your heart when you read these things, God will show you what Jesus purchased for you on the cross. And it will make a bigger impact on you by the Holy Spirit than if you had physically been there and have seen Jesus die and suffer for you. You can know him better through the word of God than you can know him by just your physical circumstances. Thank you, Javier. I see one person shaking their head. Most people, oh, no way. It's absolutely true. And the good thing about it is, see, emotions come and go. You can't get a handle on them. You cannot force yourself to always be feeling a certain way. Things happen. You know, if, if somebody was to come rushing in here tonight and say that they got a call from somebody and somebody back home, you know, your children, your parents, your friend, somebody uh, died in a car wreck, and if they came and told you that, did you know you would immediately have emotions? And it could be a lie. It could be somebody that's coming up and telling you a lie. There is no reality to it. There's no fact. But if you perceive it as fact, then you'd sit there and feel grief or sorrow. Or if you knew that it was a lie, you'd feel anger about why in the world would you come and tell me something like that? And there could be no reality to it at all. And brothers and sisters, we are being fed lies Constantly, constantly. I mean, the, many of you don't believe this, but the truth is 90% of the stuff that you hear on a daily basis, it's all lies. It's all distortions. Did you know when this virus hit, they said that the reason they clamped down and, and quarantined people and shut businesses wasn't just because people getting sick and dying, it was because it would overwhelm our health care system and we wouldn't be able to accommodate people who were sick and so therefore people who had an emergency wouldn't be able to get into the hospitals and so this is the reason that Samaritan's Purse, you know, put in these temporary hospitals. It's the reason they did a lot of things. It wasn't just because of the virus it was because they thought it was going to overwhelm the healthcare system and they made these dire predictions. Did you know every one of them was wrong? They set up some military hospitals with all of this extra thing and they never even took in a single patient. They brought that uh, ship Hope, the USS Hope or whatever, and I think they did take in a few people, but it was like one hundredth of the capacity Things were blown out of proportion and yet we hear it and it leaves you with a feeling, with an emotion because it's, it's not truth. It's an over-exaggeration. 
And we are being bombarded with this stuff. Some of you have heard me this, use this example, but I was in Scotland when they predicted the bird flu or the avian flu. I forget, you know, they called it different things on different sides of the Atlantic, and I forget which they called it here in the U.S. But anyway, they had this thing, and we were driving along, and you could see birds piled up, uh, you know, chickens and things like that. They could be piled up 20 and 30 feet high. They were using um, bulldozers. And I was over there when they did mad cow disease too. And I mean, you could drive by and see hundreds of animals piled up in the smoke just going up. They were killing animals by the hundreds of thousands because of mad cow disease and avian flu. And I was in uh, Scotland and I was listening to the television and they were talking about this and they asked the leading a uh, healthcare professional in the UK, and they said, is there a possibility of this mutating from animals into people and causing a pandemic? And he said, oh, there's no question about if it'll happen. It's just a matter of when. It might be one year or two years, but one third of the world's population will die through this flu. One third. That's billions of people. And I just happened to be there two years later and they were following up on that story and they said, how many people have died? And there was a total of 12 people <laughs> worldwide who had died of avian flu. And yet they were making these predictions and it caused fear and caused emotions. And this is where most of us live. We don't deal with reality. We deal with perception. And I could just go on and on and on. The same thing is happening with the Black Lives Matter, the protest and things like this. You know, uh, it's wrong what this policeman did to George Floyd. I can't, uh, I can't see any justification for it. It was, it was wrong. But we have like 800,000 policemen. And if you hear of 12 stories in a year where some policeman has killed uh, somebody, that would be... Uh, probably an exception. It might be more than that. But anyway, it is minute, minute. And yet they're wanting to disband and defund policemen. <laughs> that is just ignorance gone to seed. But it doesn't matter what facts are. It doesn't matter what reality is. I feel passionately about it. And people are just being led around. That's what the Bible calls carnal. Some people look at carnal and they look at that and say, well, that's sinful. Those are people who are God haters, murderers and things like this. Well, all of those things are carnal, but the word carnal means of the five senses are controlled by your five senses. And there are people that are literally being controlled by their emotions and not by what, what the word says. The Word says that God will never leave you nor forsake you. But most people, I don't care what the Word says, I don't feel it. Oh, God, touch me. And we go to begging and pleading. You know what that is? Unbelief. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. The, the joy of the Lord is your strength. You've got love, joy, and peace in you. And the fruit of the Spirit. No, no, I could go and quote a lot of things. God says all of these things, and probably the majority of us know it, but it doesn't matter what you know. It doesn't matter what the truth is. I don't feel it. I'm just telling you, pull your thumb out of your mouth and grow up. Get to where you know God by what the Word says, what reality is, and it doesn't matter how you feel. There's times that you don't feel well, but the Bible says by His stripes you were healed. And the average Christian cannot get beyond their feelings. They say, well, I know it says that, but it's obvious I'm not healed. Why? Because I don't feel healed. It doesn't mean anything. There's a lot of you, you know, we're in church and so, oh yes, amen. But in reality, you believe what you feel more than you believe what the Word of God has to say. You know, I had this thing on my ear for I think it was five years and people that were here and knew me uh, saw it, and I, I never went to the doctor, but I had doctors that were at my meeting, and they'd come up and say, you got a skin cancer. I had this thing on my ear that would bleed. It was open, 
And it, I got it in the sun, and I got this big old blister on it, and I had it for about a month or something. I got tired of seeing it, so I ripped the thing off, and it never healed. And it just kept growing, and it got bigger and bigger. And I had, I've got a doctor that's on my board, and every time he'd see me, he'd get me over there. And, and Paul Milligan was our CEO at the time, and this doctor would try and tell him, now you tell Andrew, he's got to go get that thing dealt with. And praise God for Paul and people around me. They knew that I was standing and believing God. And I didn't have to look at it. Everybody else had to look at it. So I just refused to look at it. And anyway, it would bleed. I spent two years, I think, sleeping with my hand cupped over my ear so that it wouldn't bleed all over everything in my bed. I, we went and spent the night with James and Betty Robertson. I bled all over their pillow and stuff. And, and everybody was telling me, you got to do something. And I remember in Charlotte, I prayed for two people in one service who had had the exact same thing and had their ear amputated and came up and asked me to pray for them because they'd had a melanoma and they had to have it cut off. And here I was with my thing dripping blood as I prayed for them. But you know what? I believed I was healed and I just refused to go by what it looked like. I never did go get something done and my ear is healed. Amen. It's just as perfect as the other ear. And it took a while and somebody, well, why did God take five years? God didn't take five years. It was me. I don't know. For one thing, I didn't pay much attention to it. I probably could have got healed quicker if I'd have spent more time dealing with it, but it just wasn't a big deal to me. I know some of you think I'm weird, but I think you're weird. <laughs> because God has healed you, and he says, by his stripes you're healed, and you say, but I know what the word says, but the doctor said. Who gives a rip what the doctor says? And I know some of you, you can't live that way. Well, don't wake me up because this is how I'm living. I don't get sick. I don't believe in being sick. You don't have to be sick. And I'll always have somebody come, well, then how are you going to die? Well, Jesus just said, Father, into your hands, I commend my spirit. And the Bible says in James chapter 2, verse 26, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. So when your spirit leaves your body, you're dead. You can just say, Father, into your hands, I commend my spirit, and you can leave. You don't have to be sick to die. You don't have to go through all this stuff. And I'm way off of where I thought I was going. <laughs> but the point I'm trying to get at is, Philip said, no, you're wrong. You're wrong. We don't, we, we would be satisfied if we could see the Father, but we aren't satisfied with you. There was nothing wrong with Jesus. It was their perception. They were only knowing him by the flesh. They didn't know who he really was. If they would have known who he was beyond that physical body, there was nothing wrong with Jesus' physical body. It was sinless, but it wasn't special. It wasn't spectacular. If I would have been God, and if I'd have become a man, I'd have been the best specimen of human flesh that ever existed. I would have been bigger than anybody else. Man, I'd have, I'd have made Hercules look pitiful in comparison. But Jesus, he was just normal. He was natural. There was no beauty in him. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 2. There's no beauty in him that we should desire him. There was nothing in his flesh and they only knew him by the flesh. They didn't know him spiritually. Here's another way of saying this. Do you know the Lord revealed to me that I have a much greater relationship with him than Adam and Eve had before they sinned? And some of you are like, you arrogant thing. How could you say such a thing. Did you know Adam and Eve had no concept, no concept that God loved them so much that even after they rebelled at him and sold the entire human race into slavery, and Adam and Eve were the ones responsible for the deaths, deaths of billions of people, the rape of people, 
the plunder, the terrible things that have happened. They had no clue that after what they had done, that God loved them so much He would become one of them and suffer in a physical body and eventually die for them and pay their sin so that they wouldn't have to pay it, the debt themselves. They didn't know that. I know that. I've got a greater revelation of God and of God's love than they had. I know God better than Adam and Eve knew God in a sinless state. I know God better than the disciples knew God until after the resurrection and then they received the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit began to reveal it to them. The truth is, brothers and sisters, we have the potential to know God Almighty and yet very few of us really know Him. We only know Him by the physical. We only know Him if we're in a church service and the praise and worship is so great that everybody's shouting and praising God and we have a goosebump go up and down our spine and we think, man, I was touched by the Lord. And I'm not saying that that's not God that was here and touching people. But did you know He's just as real with you when He feels like He's a million miles away? When you feel discouragement, when fear is coming in on you, it looks like, man, it's over. Turn out the lights. Go home. Did you know that God is just as much with you, more with you? It is never God that's not with you. It's never God that's not releasing joy and peace and power in, a, in your life. It is never God that is in a de deficit. It's only our perception and the number one thing that hinders us perceiving it is because we're carnal. We're trying to perceive Him and touch Him in some physical, natural way. And again, He will touch you in the physical, natural realm. I'm not saying that that won't happen, but those are byproducts. That is not the focus. You have to get to where you know Him by the Spirit. You know Him through the Word of God. And you get to where you trust this Word more than you trust what you feel more than you trust what you say, more than what a doctor says, more than what the banker says, more than what circumstances say, more than what the uh, pandemic is saying and everybody else. You get to where you, the Word of God just dominates you. And this is what you base your life on. This is a more sure word of prophecy. And yet very few Christians live this way and because of it your life is up and down like a yo-yo not because God is up and down but because sometimes you are tuned in and other times you're tuned out you're plugged into the world and things like this once you understand what I'm talking about this gives you a stability in your life that nothing moves you nothing changes nothing you know, there was a time that Jamie and I had some really bad things happen to us. It made Paul Harvey's newscast, for those of you that are old enough to remember Paul Harvey, <laughs> made worldwide news, and he says, this is one of the worst things I've ever heard in my life. And we didn't tell anybody about it, but the next morning, our, our staff heard Paul Harvey, and they heard the report. And I remember that Wendell and Linda Parr drove out to our place and had a dozen donuts brought us some donuts and says, we just wanted to come out and let you know we love you and we're with you and we've covered all of your classes today. You don't have to speak. And I said, no, I'm, I'm scheduled to speak today. And they said, you can't speak after what's happened to you. And I said, why not? And they said, well, this is terrible. I said, it hadn't changed Jesus. It hadn't changed anything I was going to say about him. I don't care how I feel. And they said, but you can't do this. And it just amazed them. But I came in and I ministered four hours in school. And it was bad. It was real bad. If I was to tell you all the stuff that's happened to us, you'd feel sorry for me. <laughs> but you know what? I've just gotten to where I don't go by how I feel. How I feel does not control what's going on in my life. I refuse to be led by feelings. And there's times that I feel the presence. I have things happen. Did you know I have never told, the vast majority of physical sensations and feelings that I have, I have never told anybody about it. Because if I did, somebody would make a doctrine out of it. 
You know, Kenneth Hagin used to say that he had a burning in his hands and he'd put one hand on their chest and one hand on the back and if the fire jumped between his hands, he'd know whether they were just sick or whether it was demon possession. He had all these physical things. I have things happen to me, but I don't tell people about it because somebody would make a doctrine out of it and unless they felt the same thing that I felt, they wouldn't believe. And you know what? Some of the greatest miracles I've ever seen happened when I felt nothing. There are times that I actually, I can feel the transfer of God's anointing through me. Jesus said, I felt virtue go out of me. You can feel the power of God. I feel things, but I don't tell people what I feel unless they go to trust in him because Andrew felt something. Man, it needs to be the word of God. It, and the greatest miracles that I've ever seen happened when I felt nothing. I just learned to go by what the Word of God says. I don't do it perfectly, but I do it a lot more than I ever did. And to the degree that I do it, I see great things happen. I'm telling you, your carnal feelings, your carnal mind, you wanting to perceive everything in some physical, natural way is one of the greatest hindrances to you receiving the power of God in your life. And we just feed our flesh. You know, past generations, they'd come home from work and they'd sit on the porch. And they'd sit there and think. Or visit with a neighbor. Or talk. Or read something. We come in and we turn on the television. Or nowadays, man, you, I've been in an airport where I've looked around and seen 100 people. And there's not a single person that's not on a tablet on their phone, doing something. Most people don't know how to just, if you have a spare moment, you're checking to see what's going on and what's happening. There is no downtime whatsoever, and yet the Bible makes it very clear. Be still and know that I am God. But we are feeding this carnal self all of the time. We are just, we've become information junkies. You know, Adam and Eve, it was their lust for the knowledge of good and evil. They wanted to know more. That's what Satan tempted them with, and he's still tempting us. We're so afraid we're going to miss something. I'm telling you, if, if we get into World War III, somebody will tell you about it. You don't have to be checking day and night and have some kind of an alert on your phone so that they alert you every time something happens. If something really important happens, you'll hear about it. You don't have to be plugged in all of the time to the world. And yet I can guarantee you that people, especially the younger generation, they just live there. They don't, I've actually seen people sit at the same table and text each other. <laughs> that, that just blows me away. It's amazing. My point is we are controlled by this natural realm. We don't let our spirit man have very much control. We don't sit and let the spirit man just dominate us and, and meditate on the things of God. We are constantly in this flesh realm. And brothers and sisters, it is super detrimental to walk in with the Lord. The parable of the sower sowing the seed, the third type of soil was the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things entering in chokes the word and it becomes unfruitful. The word of God, the spirit man, isn't having ascendancy in most people's lives because of just natural physical things. And again, our world system, the news media today is just so negative. I've given examples like that bird flu and other things, but they just predict the worst thing. I had a meeting with the chief of police last night and we were talking about some things that are happening here in this community and he just pointed out a certain reporter in town who I've had personal dealings with and they don't, they don't just report the news, they take things and they make up stories and we had a major problem with the guy who was the, um, anyway, he, he was on one of the city boards. And in the papers, there was just a feud going on between Karis Bible College and this other person. And so finally, the previous mayor, 
he says, you guys need to work this out. And so he brought him over here and we sat down and talked and we really didn't have any difference over anything. It was the reporter that would take one statement and put it in the wrong context and twist it and he got mad at me over something that I never said and then it would, and there wasn't a problem. It was all fabricated. And this is what's happening. Bad news is what sells. And sad to say, we're listening to this. Man, there's so many scriptures. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then, when you meditate in it day and night, then will you make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Philippians chapter 4, I believe it's around verse 7 and 8. If there's anything that's virtuous and has glory and praise in it. Think on these things, things that are honest and true and lovely and just. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, 90-something percent of everything you're listening to every single day violates those scriptures. You're putting junk in you, putting garbage in you, and then wondering why garbage comes out. Wondering why it's so hard to believe God when the Bible says that by his stripes I'm healed. It's because you've watched a million commercials that'll tell you about this sickness. And as you get older, this is going to happen. And they've conditioned you and taught you all of this stuff. You can get to where you're so focused on God, you don't know how to disbelieve God. That can happen. It can happen. And I could give you some stories. I still haven't made it to the passage I was wanting to share with you. <laughs> I got 10 minutes. Let me real quickly just turn over here and I'll try and summarize this because I got something else I want to minister on Thursday night. Tomorrow night's when we're having our panel discussion with these people. And so um, anyway, look here in Luke chapter 24 and I'll try and make this quick. But in Luke chapter 24 is resurrection day and the women went to the tomb and saw the angels and they said, why are you seeking the living among the dead? And they went back and told the disciples about the angels telling them that Jesus was risen from the dead. And down here in chapter 24 and beginning with verse uh, 13, this, this passage is something that God used in my life probably 40-something years ago, and it has been one of the most significant things that God ever spoke to me, and it's right along the lines of everything that we're saying here tonight. And so in verse uh, 13, it says, And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about threescore furlongs, seven miles. And they talked together of all these things, which had happened. What things were they talking about? The angels telling them that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. They had the word. They had a report that Jesus had overcome death. And that's what they were talking about. And it says in verse 15, And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. This is amazing to me. And as you read the rest of this, I'm probably not going to have time to go through this, but as you read the rest of it, these were some of his personal disciples. I believe it was personally uh, some of the 11 disciples that were left. It doesn't say it clearly, but it certainly implies it. But they were close enough to Jesus that they were at least a part of the 70 because right after this experience, they ran back to Jerusalem immediately and as they were telling the story, Jesus appeared in the room and spoke to them. So these were some of the close associates of Jesus. They had been with him for three and a half years and here's Jesus walking with them and they didn't recognize him. It says their eyes were holding that they didn't know him. And the story goes on. He says, what kind of communications are these that you have one with another as you walk and are sad? Did you know they were talking about Jesus? And they weren't just talking about Jesus being dead. They were talking about Jesus being resurrected from the dead. They were talking about the resurrection and yet they were sad. You know why? Because they didn't believe it. They were struggling to believe. 
So they were talking about the right things, but it wasn't producing the right results because they weren't really convinced of it. They were operating in unbelief. And so he starts talking to them and they say, are you only a stranger in Jerusalem? You don't know what's happened. And then they begin to tell him. And he says, oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have said. And then he began from Moses and he went through all of the Old Testament and explained scripture to them. And then after they reached their destination in Emmaus, uh, he made as though he would have gone on. Man, there's a message in that. I hadn't got time, but that is a great message right there about the nature and the character of God. And they compelled him to come in. And as he was breaking bread, he blessed the bread and prayed over it. And in the breaking of bread, all of a sudden they recognized who he was. Not by sight, but they had been with him at the Last Supper. And he had just done this. And all of a sudden they realized this is Jesus. They had spent two to three hours walking with him and talking to him and they didn't even recognize who it was. They didn't recognize him by his looks. They recognized him by his mannerisms, by the way he was doing things. They, they recognized him by who he was on the inside, not by how he looked on the outside. And the moment they recognized who he was, he vanished. There's a great message in that that Jesus will manifest himself to you in some physical way trying to reach you. But the moment you get into faith, that physical thing will be gone because faith is better than sight. We walk by faith and not by sight is what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Walking by faith is better than walking by sight. You know, I saw all of these buildings on the inside of me. I sat down and drew this on a napkin. I drew that other building over there. I drew all of these things. I, I sat here and saw all of this. I prayed about this. All of this was on the inside of me at one time. And I used to walk this property when there was nothing on this property. And then when they started putting things up, I walked through every single day and I prayed over it and I saw all of these things. And I saw it by faith. And now that I see it with my eyes... Did you know seeing it by faith is more? It's better. I'm already looking down the road. I've got other buildings I'm walking, walking through and seeing. Amen. Did you know this isn't exciting? This isn't as exciting to me as when I see it in faith. When I'm walking in faith, to me, is more exciting. It's like we, we built a building down in Colorado Springs and we had a dedication service and everybody was just shouting and praising God because it was an absolute miracle. And I had a person walk up to me at the dedication and they said, you don't seem excited. And I said, I'm excited. I'm always like this. <laughs> we actually went to Disney World and they took pictures, you know, on the roller coaster and on these rides. And they take these pictures and you're screaming like, ah! And, and then at the end, they sell you the picture. You could have taken a picture of me right now. And this is the way I was on the roller coaster. <laughs> I have to tell people when I'm excited because I'm always like this, but I am excited. Inside, I'm jumping up and down. But anyway, my point is, I, I was just standing there and I was praising God and this woman, you don't seem excited. Aren't you excited to see this? And I said, I saw this months ago. I've already seen it. This is anticlimactic for me when I see it with my eyes. Seeing... I don't have the words to express this to you, but seeing with your heart is so much more real than seeing with your eyes. And I know that that went right over the head of a lot of people because this is not how the average person lives. The average person, man, you only use faith until you can get something in the physical. And the moment you get the physical, throw faith aside because this is what you are after. Man, it's just the opposite with me. Faith is more real to me than when I see something with my eyes, when I feel it. Hey man, I, I wish I had a better way to describe that. Some people think I'm weird, but I think you're weird. <laughs> Paul says we walk by faith and not by sight. We aren't supposed to be limited to our physical senses. 
The reason these disciples did not recognize Jesus is because their eyes were holding. You know what that means? You can keep your finger there, but I'm going to turn over to Mark chapter 16 and read the exact same instance to you out of Mark's gospel, and he summarizes this entire uh, experience in one verse. In Mark chapter 16, and um, where is this? I think it's verse 12. After that, he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. If you study it out, this is the exact same thing, and the whole thing's summarized by him saying that Jesus appeared in another form. What does that mean, that he had another form? Did it mean he didn't, wasn't recognizable? No, because that, again, if you turn back over to Luke chapter 24, that same day they ran back to Jerusalem and as they were telling everybody else about that they had seen Jesus, Jesus appeared in the room with the doors and the windows shut and he appeared and they were shocked. And he says, put your finger into the print of the nails. Thrust your hand into my side. Don't be faithless, but believe him. He, he was the same person. He still had the print of the nails in his body. It wasn't that he looked differently. The difference was he was in a glorified body, in a spiritual body, and he even said, he says, touch me because a spirit has not flesh and bone as I have. And then he ate some fish and a honeycomb. So he had a body it wasn't just some kind of a spiritual manifestation. It was a body, but it was a glorified body. And it says over in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, that the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God because they're foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. You have to know spiritual things by the Spirit. You can't discern spiritual things with your five senses. That's a huge statement right there that some people might disagree with. If I had time, I could verify that. But you can't, you know, Jesus said it this way. He says, that which is spirit is spirit, and that which is flesh is flesh. That's just saying, you know, the way we would say it today is that they're in two different realms. The spiritual realm and physical realm are two different realms. Now, you are part spirit and flesh, and so you can function in both of these realms, but most of us only function in the physical realm, in the carnal realm. We don't use our spirit to know God. And how is it that you discern what is spiritually true? Do you get into a lotus position and go om? Well, you can get into the spiritual realm doing that, but that's not God's spirit. Jesus said in John chapter 6, verse 63, it's the spirit that quickens, the flesh profiteth nothing. Now, that's not to say that, you know, it's useless or worthless because if, you, if your flesh isn't alive, you leave this life. You have to have your body. You have to have this flesh in order to exist. It's like your earth suit, and you can't get around in this realm without it. But relative to the Spirit, the Spirit is the life-giving part of you. God is a spirit. John chapter 4, verse 24, God is a spirit. And to really know God, you have to know him in spirit and in truth. What is spirit? The words that I speak unto you. John 6, 63, I only quoted the first part. First part says, it's the spirit that quickens the flesh, profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. This word is alive. It's living this isn't just a physical book. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, the Word of God is quick. That word quick in the King James means alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joint and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. This Word is alive. It's living. And you can take this and you can know God better through the revealed word of God than if you would have been one of his disciples. These disciples struggled to believe who Jesus was, not because his form had changed, but because now he was a spiritual being completely. 
And even in the spirit realm, there is such a thing as a glorified spiritual body. He had a body, but it was no longer carnal. It was spiritual. And you can't know spiritual things in carnal ways. And they only knew him after the flesh. This is the exact terminology that Paul used in Galatians, I mean in 2 Corinthians 5, 16. Henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, all things are become new. Now we have to know things by the Spirit. And they were still carnal. They hadn't received the baptism of the Holy Spirit yet. And they just couldn't perceive who this was. I wish I had time. I was going to do all of this tonight, but you go look it up. There are, I think, um, eight times that Jesus appeared after his resurrection to people. Eight separate times. And in every single instance, they didn't recognize him. Sometimes it's subtle. You might have to look for it. But if you, if you look for it, Every single time, Mary Magdalene thought he was the gardener until he called her name and she recognized him not by sight but by the way she had heard him call his, her name before. They were uh, all together in Galilee and they were sitting around a fire and Jesus had fish on the fire. And these were his 11 apostles, the 11 that were left after Judas had killed himself. And it says there in uh, John chapter 21, it says no one dared ask him who it was, knowing that it was Jesus. Why would you even mention this? You're sitting here six feet away from him, physical distancing. <laughs> and you're looking at him, and, and they're saying nobody had enough nerve to ask, who are you? Why would they even mention that? Because they didn't know him by sight. They had to know him by who he was by what his heart was, by his actions, not by just looking at him. And let me read one verse to you. This, to me, is the most obvious of all of these. But in Matthew chapter 28, they went into a mountain where he had agreed to meet with them. And it says in verse uh, 16, Then the eleven disciples, so this is talking about Peter, James, and John, the eleven disciples after Judas had hung himself. There was only 11 left. And it says the 11 disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Some who? These were his 11 apostles, the people that had been with him day and night for three and a half years. They were looking at him and some of them, Peter, James, John, Bartholomew, Andrew, all of the disciples doubted that this was really Jesus. That is amazing. And people think, how could they doubt? Because they only knew him after the flesh. This is before they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And even, he wasn't in the flesh anymore. He was in a glorified body. And you can't perceive spiritual things with just your physical, natural mind and senses. And they were just limited to the carnal part of them. They were carnal, just like most Christians today. They know that the Bible says he's with them, but I don't feel it. And so if you don't feel it, it's not real. And so you just go around begging God to touch you. If I was God, the spirit of slap had come all over me. <laughs> Man, I promise you, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'm with you always. But it doesn't matter what I've said. If you can't feel it, well, then it doesn't matter. My word means nothing. It's just what you feel. And if I was God, I'd just drop kick you off into space. Man, praise God for God and for mercy. But did you know, like I was saying, 30 or 40 years ago, God showed me this example about these disciples and I realized that God, you're always with me. Sometimes I perceive it more than other times, but I don't ever doubt that God is with me. 
I sit here and take the word and I stand on what the word says more than what I feel. I believe that I am anointed by God. Carrie was talking about being a missionary in Russia and couldn't even lead the taxi driver to the Lord and feeling like, what kind of a missionary are you? <laughs> I've felt these exact same things. There's times that I don't feel like I'm effective, but I'm not going to sit here and say it because God said he counted me faithful. He put me in the ministry. And I've just learned to dominate my life by it. And I'm not a perfect example. I haven't arrived, but I've left. And I am seeing God do miracles. And I'm just telling you that God is with every one of you more than you have ever realized. And if you don't feel his presence, it's not him that's not present. It's you that's walking in the carnal, in the flesh. If you don't feel anointed, if you don't feel called, if you don't feel loved, if you feel fear, if you are worried about something, it's never Jesus that's the problem. He is more than enough. His grace is sufficient for any of us. It's only our perception that's messed up. And how did they recognize him? Through communion. He broke the bread. And through communion with him, their eyes were open. And then they said, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us in the way and, and opened the scriptures to us. You know, Jamie and I have been blessed to see our son raised from the dead. I've seen Jamie raised from the dead. I've seen multiple people raised from the dead. We've, I told you we saw a little baby raised from the dead right here. We see miracles. I've had some awesome things happen. But I could tell you the greatest thing the greatest experience I've ever had in my life is the Word of God coming alive to me and burning on the inside of me. That's what Jeremiah said. He said, His Word was like fire shut up in my bones. I couldn't forbear. There are probably some people in here that have never had the Word just come alive and burn on the inside of you. But it's the greatest thing, man. It's... Greater than seeing the dead raised, it's greater than anything else. It's the greatest thing you could ever experience. To have God take words on a page and make them come alive on the inside of you, it's awesome. If you've never experienced that, if you don't know God through the Word, you are missing out on the greatest experience. It's greater than seeing the blind eyes open, deaf ears open. It's the greatest thing you could ever experience. And man, this has just transformed my life. And I, I just know that there are people here that you're born again, you love God. If you were to die, you'd go to be with Jesus in heaven. But you were trying to experience Him in just some physical, natural way. And God is a spirit. And for you to really connect with him, you have to worship him in spirit and in truth. John 4, 24. It didn't say that that's the best way to worship him. It says you must worship him in spirit and in truth. And most of us aren't worshiping him in spirit. We're trying to connect with him in some physical, natural way. Trying to create a mood. Man, I'm amazed at churches today, the things that they do to create a mood for the Holy Spirit and turn everything black and turn on smoke and strobe lights and man God's not in all those smoke and mirrors and things like this you know this is another good thing that can come out of this pandemic is that some of us have been taken away from the carnal things that have become so much a part of our relationship with God and we're just having to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And some people aren't enjoying it very much because it wasn't spirit what you were doing. It was carnal what you were doing. And now that you've had some of the carnal stripped away, all of a sudden you're, you're lonely and you're discouraged and stuff and it just speaks to the fact that so much of our relationship is carnal. Amen or oh me. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, there's, there's a depth of knowing God that very few of us have tapped into. 
And I don't believe that there's a single person in here that knows God as well as He wants us to know Him. There's always more. You know, I just had a friend of mine from Scotland quote some scripture to me and sent me an email and he says, God is wanting to give you whatever you want. What is it that you want? And rather than make a quick decision, I decided, man, I better think about this. It's like one wish. <laughs> and I want to make sure I get this right. So I prayed about it for nearly a week. And I mean, I was every day like, God, what is, what is the one thing I really want more than anything else? And it was getting to where it was bothering me because I wanted to know, God, what is it? And anyway, one day as I was walking out the door, I was praying about it and I said, God, what I really want more than anything else is to know you more. And as soon as I said it, I said, man, that's it. Everything else that I need is all wrapped up in that. And I believe that according to this brother who's prophesying to me, I believe God's answering that. I believe I'm coming to know God more. And the way you do it is through the Word. He reveals Himself to you through the Word. This is alive. It's spirit and it's life. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, we need to get to where we put a priority on knowing this, walking by faith and not by sight. And if you'll do that, Jesus is everything you need. You don't need more of a touch from God. You're already touched. Touched in the head. That's the problem. Man, we just need to get to where we renew our mind and focus on what this says and go by what this says. Who cares what anybody else says? Who cares what the natural says? You can reach a place where it just really doesn't bother you. It doesn't, it's not important. This is the only thing that's important. What does God say about you? Do you know who you are in Christ? Do you know what you have? I, I dare to say that the majority of Christians don't. We have an idea of who we are in the flesh, but not who we are in the Spirit. And, and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So you've got to get in here and through the Word of God, not only come to know who God is, but you need to come to know who you are. You need to come to know what God has done on the inside of you. And I tell you, you're awesome. You're awesome. On Thursday, this is what I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to help you to see who you are in the Spirit because most of us don't know. But I'm telling you, this is the key to everything. God's done everything for you that you need to have done. You don't need Him to do anything else. He is seated at the Father's right hand. You aren't waiting on God to move. God's waiting on you to find out who He really is and what He's already done and just release it. You don't have to get God to do anything. He's anticipated everything you'll ever need. It's already supplied. It's just a matter of releasing, not going and getting something that you don't have. Man, that's awesome. If I was listening to this message, I'd say amen. That's good. That's good stuff. Father, we love you and we thank you, Father for everything you've done for us. And thank you, just as those disciples had God in the flesh dwelling in their midst. God Almighty standing right there, and yet Philip wasn't satisfied. He wanted something more. Father, I pray that you'd help us not to make the same mistake. Father, help us to perceive who you really are, not only on the throne, but in us. Help us to perceive what you've done in us, what we have, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead now lives on the inside of us. Father, we pray for this spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you, the eyes of our understanding being enlightened, that we might know the hope of your calling, the exceeding greatness of your power towards us, the same power that you used when you raised Jesus Christ from the dead and set him at your own right hand in the heavenly places. Father, we thank you that you'd help us to see the height, the depth, the length, and the breadth, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge so that we could be filled with all the fullness of God. Father, that's our prayer today, that we want to know you more. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you are everything. And I'm just praying that, Father, this hunger to know you, not to get something more, but just to find out what you've already done, I pray that that hunger would come alive on the inside of people. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we agree. We receive it in Jesus' name. I want our prayer ministers to come down here. And God is touching people right now. Man, there's some of you that you nothing in the natural has changed, but your focus has changed. Now you're looking at God instead of looking at the problem. And hope is beginning to rise on the inside of you. And right now, you just need to latch on to that. You need to grab hold of this. You need to start walking by faith and not by sight. Praise the Lord. Father, I thank you for this. You know, there's somebody here that the Lord's speaking to me right now that he's called you into ministry. You know it in your heart. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. But you have looked at yourself and at your inadequacies and your failures and you just can't see it. And you have not obeyed. You just feel like, how could this ever happen? You're trying to figure it all out in the flesh, in the natural realm, and it doesn't come that way. You are going to have to embrace what you know in your heart when there is zero proof of it. You feel like you are the least likely person on the planet to be representing God, but you know it. You know that's what God's told you to do. You need to respond to this right now. You need to humble yourself. And you need to start walking by faith and not by sight. You know, you could take this word that I'm sharing and just go back to your hotel room or go home and stuff, but the Bible says faith without works is dead. And you know that God is speaking to you right now. There's more than one person that what I've just said fits you. And you need to do something right now.
you need to respond. If you know that's you, I want you to stand up. Just come down here. Let somebody pray with you. And just by doing that, say, I know this is me. I'm going to walk on this. I'm going to step out. And if you'll do that, I guarantee you it's going to change your life. Amen. Amen. There's a number of people coming. Father, we thank you for that. Thank you, Jesus. There's people in here that you know that God has an anointing on your life to prosper financially. You're a business person. And you know that you have this anointing and this call, and yet you aren't seeing it come to pass. What you see in the natural is different than what you see in your heart. And because of it, you're discouraged. You may not use this terminology, but you aren't satisfied because you're looking at things just in the natural. God is speaking to some of you. You need to go by what God spoke to you. You need to stand up and you need to say, I don't care what the things look like. I don't care if they're coming to foreclose and take away everything I've got. I know what God called me to do. And God, if you have to turn something into money, I believe that you are just going to do it. Somehow or another, I am prospering. If that's you, I want you to come forward. You let someone agree with you and stand in agreement. Take a step of faith. Do something. Amen. Praise God. Father, we thank you. There are people here that you need to be healed tonight. And you don't feel healed. And what the doctor has said about you is more real than what God has said about you. And I will admit that this is a process. Sometimes you see an instantaneous miracle, but did you know the greatest miracles probably that I've seen are a process. Now you can get healed instantly and there's no bad way to receive healing, but there's some of you that you just need to start the process tonight. You need to say, I know what God's word says and I'm going to get to a place where I am not going to be controlled by how I feel, by what the doctor has to say about me and you start standing on that. If that's you, you need to come. You need to let somebody agree with you. But Father, we just pray with all of these people right now. Do we have other students here that can pray? I know that I want to invite other people to come up here. If you are a student, if you've helped us, Javier, you come up here. You guys down here, Daniel, if you guys would. The Jollies, Jason and Sarah, Anyway, if, let's just get more people down here so that we can pray for everybody. But if God is speaking to you, do something. Act on your faith and come forward and let somebody agree with you. Praise God. We believe that miracles are taking place right now. Father, we just speak healing over people. We walk by faith and not by sight. Father, we aren't looking and just desiring something in the natural, but we believe that as we get our focus on you, that the natural will take care of itself, that physical healings will come to pass, that finances will come in, that things in the natural will happen. Father, we just stand on the Word of God. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, speaking to me that there's somebody else here that you have this is new to you, that you could walk by faith and not by sight. You've heard that phrase, but it's become a revelation to you tonight. And you realize the problem is I'm just carnal. I'm just trying to figure everything out in the natural instead of relating to God by the Spirit, instead of worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. I think that there's a lot of people out here that could probably relate to this and say, man, this is something new. I've not, I've not even been desiring the right thing. And tonight God has spoken to you and you need to humble yourself and receive, the Bible says, receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. So let me just pray for you right now. Father, for those who are willing to start walking by faith and not by sight, to elevate the word of God above what they feel, above what other people say. Father, I pray for them right now and I believe that the Holy Spirit will just supernaturally empower them, enable them to be able to start walking by faith. Father, we agree and we receive that. If there's anybody here who doesn't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues, 
I tell you, speaking in tongues is the probably the most important thing in the natural that you can do to activate the power of the Holy Spirit. You need to speak in tongues. Speaking in tongues is powerful. If you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, don't leave here without receiving it. Any one of these people can pray with you and help you to receive. But I tell you, you need this baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's awesome. Father, we just thank you for touching people's lives. Thank you, Father. We believe that we're all leaving this place different, focused on you, coming to know you in spirit and in truth. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we...